120 days or something. Wow. And um, about day 80, I realized like that was not going to be sustainable forever. Um, and my sister has a really beautiful, like big beach house in Rhode Island, which is isn't too far from here. Um, and uh, so we drove up there for all of July. And then I realized yesterday that we were supposed to come home and I was also supposed to do this. So thank you for making the date switch. Oh, um, but no. we are back. I'm in Brooklyn again, um, which is both sad and also like, it's really nice to be in my bed again. So yeah, I'm back for the long haul. Now I'm, I'm ready to isolate for as long as I need to. Yeah. So. Do you feel like it's um, that New York is feeling a little bit more manageable and comfortable? Yeah. I mean, we are obviously we were right in we were the hot spot for a long time. And um, it was really sad for a lot of people here. There, You know, we all knew people who had lost people. Yeah. Um, and now I think that's why we're taking it so seriously now. And so people are really good about masking. They're really good about, um, you know, just being careful in general, staying distanced. Um, you know, I haven't seen a person without a mask in a store since March. So um, I know that that's different in other places. And um, hopefully it won't take the full New York experience for it to get um, to people in other places. But I hope you're all being safe and um, healthy. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's getting interesting where I am because I'm getting more and more, fr I find myself more and more frustrated when I do see people without masks, just because it is so ingrained in our heads over these last four months. And um, yeah. 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 Well, hopefully, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping that people will learn from us. Yeah. So if that, if that's, if, if we had to go through that for everyone else to be smarter, then I guess that's how it should be. That's to help. Well, and what's really great, I think, about um, this time, you know, if we have to find a silver lining and things, it's been the rediscovering of books and, and pleasure time and, and people are finding comforts. And I think that your books are definitely books that bring people so much comfort. And to have the finishing of a series right at the smack, you know, right in the middle of, of this um, happening, can, I, I just want to kind of jump into how you got started as a writer and then we can yeah, get right their knuckles. Yeah, sure. So um, yeah, how did you get started as a writer? What sparked you? Um, I have always been, well, I'm a romance reader first, like most of you. Um, I started reading romance when I was 10 or 11, like way too young probably to be reading romance, but I did fine, so fine. Um, my older sister was a romance reader and she was a Harlequin um, book club sub subscriber. So she would get the shipments of Harlequins every month. And um, she would shove her presents under the bed and I would like pull them out on the other side and read them. And so for me, growing up a romance reader, going to college as a romance reader, like becoming a person in the world as a romance reader, it just sort of was a natural extension, I think, of my reading. Mm -hmm. And I talk about it now and, and I'm still sort of amazed anytime I meet one of my uh, my, my, the authors who made me a romance reader, right? Like I, uh, the first time I ever met Lisa Kleypas, I had like six, well, I didn't actually meet Lisa Kleypas because I had something like six books out and I walked into a room at RWA and, um, my editor who works at Avon, um, said, oh, we should go over there and introduce our, and, and I'll introduce you to Lisa Kleypas. And I just peaced out. I just like immediately peeled away from the conversation and like walked out of the room. And I was You were like, Homer not, Simpsoning into a bush. <laughs> I'm not doing that. <laughs> um, so I still, you know, get, I get nervous and excited whenever I meet my favorite authors. And that still happens today. Um, and so it's always a little weird that I actually did end up writing, but I did. Um, I had a friend who, well, when I first moved to New York after college, I worked in publishing, but not anywhere near a publishing house. I um, worked for a very um, small, very literary, like I hid my romance novels from my boss kind mm -hmm. of um, publicity firm and um you know publishing is a small world and we were all out twilight had just started like YA was exploding um and 
I said, I, we went out and we had drinks, I, a bunch of us. And I said, you know, I feel like I could write a YA novel. I feel like that's a thing I could do. And a friend sort of just turned to me and said, well, I dare you to. And I'd had just enough alcohol that I went home and I wrote the first chapter that night of what would become the season. Um, and then, so that was really just for fun. It was like to prove that I could do it. And then when I was done, I had a book and mm -hmm. then I sold it, which was really fun. And like, I, but I didn't have an agent, like a friend of a friend of a friend. I, it sort of like passed through multiple emails to get to a random person who edited books at Scholastic. Um, and then they offered me money for it. And I signed a contract without an agent, which I would never, ever, ever uh, recommend. <laughs> and then because I had signed this contract without an agent, it was very restrictive. And so I couldn't write any more YA novels while I was waiting for that book to come out. And that was fine because I had sort of decided that I wanted to write the books that I had grown up loving. Mm -hmm. And so I sat down and again, for fun, I started writing or to like prove to myself that I could do it. I started writing Nine Rules to Break When Romancing a Rake which is basically if you like peeled open my brain and just like poured out like my id onto a page into a book, it would be nine rules. Like it had all the books, all the pieces of books that I have always loved as a romance reader. Um, and then I was smart enough to get an agent at that point. Like I had learned <laughs> my mistakes. And I got an agent and then she took me to Avon. Um, she took me to a number of places, but I remember going to meet with the editor at Avon and sitting, I, they sat me down and on my editor's wall um, at the offices was a giant blow up of the original cover of Jude Devereaux's The Black Lion, which was the first historical I'd ever read. And I was like, it's a sign. Like I have to publish here. This is my dream. Um, and she, but I was not very, I didn't really, for all the years that I had had read romance, I wasn't very smart about how romance existed. And so ultimately when they, when they said, you know, yes, we'd like this book, they said, we'd like three of them. And I was like, but there's one of them. <laughs> I don't have three. The other two. I have one. <laughs> and my editor was like, no, but you do have three. You have a brother and a sister. And like, you're going to write all of that, those stories. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, and then, then it's just sort of a normal story after that. But, um, you know, I still pinch myself. I'm so lucky. Um, so many really incredibly skilled writers don't just, they don't, they don't have the same experience that I have because, you know, publishing is 70% hard work and 30% luck. And, yeah. you know, when Nine Rules was pitched to Avon, when, when they brought it to editors at Avon, um, they brought it to an editor at Avon who didn't love it, who sort of didn't think that she could do anything of it with it, didn't think it was publishable really. It was not her thing. And she, instead of binning it, which is what a lot of editors would have done, lifted it up off her desk and like walked down the hallway to my editor and said, you know, I think maybe you might want to deal with this debut author who like has written this very long kind of like flabby book and like, can you fix it with her? And like my editor, who knows why she took a risk on me. Luck is a huge piece of it. And I'm, I'm, I consider, I, like thank my lucky stars every day that I get to do this job and like hang out with people like you who all just want to talk about romance novels all the time, which is all I want to do too. Right. So mm -hmm. yeah. It's like, we love talking about the things that make us all happy. Exactly. Exactly. What a fun job. <laughs> well, and as you know, you've, you've definitely demonstrated the fact that you are a proud romance reader and a proud romance writer. You're also a proud feminist and out there talking about the importance of feminism in um, and romance and like also being proud of being a romance reader. Can you talk a little bit about um, your evolution into that and being more comfortable about talking to readers and to critics about um, the importance of feminism in, in romances? Yeah, it never occurred to me. Honestly, it, I always thought that the reason why people were weird about romance novels, like uh, when I was a kid was because there was sex in them. Like I, I didn't, it never occurred to me when I first started reading them that anybody was sort of saying the things that we hear so much about, you know, they set unrealistic expectations for women or like, they're all about like women having to be like, having to submit 
Um, mm -hmm. That never occurred to me because the books that I read, no, they never seemed like that. It always seemed like the heroine won at the end of the book um, to me. And then when I got to, I went to Smith, under Smith College undergrad and Smith is like the like cradle of second wave feminism. Like it produced Betty Friedan and Gloria Steinem and like many, many other big, big feminists. And I studied romance at Smith um, and when that's the first time that I started hearing these kind of other voices about romance and what it was and how it worked and um, how debilitating it was for women. And so I started then talking about the reverse because I didn't feel like it was debilitating at all for me. And I'd been reading it for a decade at that mm -hmm. point. Um, so for me, uh, that work, the work of like finding my voice to defend romance was never really very much work because I think I sort of cut my teeth on defending romance at university. Yeah. Um, so that was all very easy, but I did like, I confess when I, I got that really posh publishing job and I never admitted that I read romance to my boss because suddenly it's like all of a sudden your eyes are open and you start to see that the way the world looks at something you really love. Um, but romance is so feminist. It has been from the beginning, you know, even when people talk now, I, I have a podcast and um, it's called Faded Mates and it comes out every Wednesday. And this last season, we've been talking about the books that we think kind of transformed the genre for us and really showed us what romance could be. Um, and we've talked about Joanna Lindsay's Gentle Rogue and Julie Garwood's The Bride and like Loretta Chase's Lord of Scoundrels and Judith McNaught's, you know, A Kingdom of Dreams. And when you talk about things like McNaught, you don't, you have sort of no choice. You have to tackle the fact that, you know, Whitney and other early McNaught's have problematic elements in them that maybe don't feel very feminist. But when you talk about something like the early books in the genre and things like sexual assault on, on page or, you know, other issues that, that pop up in those books, you have to remember that romance is constantly iterating the world that it's, it's being written in. And so in 1972, when, you know, Kathleen Wood always wrote The Flame and the Flower, women couldn't hold credit, hold their, have their own bank accounts if they were married a married woman could not legally be raped by her husband. Like these were things that like sexual assault and the, sub the sublimation of women in the world and patriarchy all existed. And romance was the only place where that stuff was being talked about overtly on page. And I think that a lot of the times when we talk about early romances specifically, a lot of those people have never read those romances or if they have, they weren't reading very closely because Kathleen Woodowis never says like, rape is great. You know, like Kathleen Woodowis names it, Heather names it, Brandon is punished for it. Um, Clayton too, the, you know, the early book, the original version, like it's named, it's discussed, it's, it's, it's problematic on the page in the early version. And then of course, there's the whole other piece, which is Judith McNaught changed the book ultimately right. because she felt like you know, it was time to tell a different kind of story. And so for me, I think that, I think romance is feminist because it's always having that conversation with women and other marginalized people, people who don't, aren't, whose gaze isn't always represented in the media um, about the world that they live in and the, the struggles they have. And now you've got me, like, I realize I'm no, I love it. A lot. <laughs> no, 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 but no, it was great. <laughs> no, I thought it, it was wonderful. Thank you. No, <laughs> I wasn't, but I wasn't I mean, fishing for a thing. <laughs> that's what I love about where we're going in romance. Like what I love about romance in 2020 is we are starting, like romance has always been a genre that explicitly rejects a dominant worldview, right? It explicitly rejects cisgender heterosexual white men as a like common gaze mm -hmm. and it it centers the gaze of other of you know women of of trans people of diverse readers of you know many many different things and it has always done that and now it just seems to have like exploded, exploded. with all of these different worldviews and 
that's what's magnificent about romance, right? Because Tessa Bailey, I love Tessa Bailey likes to say, the best thing about romance is being a romance reader is that you can wake up every morning and say like, who do I want to be today? And then you can choose the character you want to be and live their best life, like yeah. live their life in hope and happiness and triumph. And that is a genre that I think is really valuable. I think it's a genre that's really intersectionally feminist. We're moving toward a really like solid intersectionally feminist, you know, DNA. And I'm really proud to be a part of it. Yeah. Well, and especially with the Bare Knuckle Bastard series, I think um, Danielle, who's with us right now, she wrote a really awesome article that we published yesterday about the series. Um, and she has a line in, in the article about how it's so compelling because you're, star you're sharing stories about the fringe, about people that aren't necessarily in the ton and, and, and it's not about like the beauty and the frivolousness of London. Um, and I'm just curious about what was so appealing about that, about kind of dealing with the characters that are on the fringe, again, speaking to the marginalized people, people that aren't, people don't always right. think about. Right. Um, well, Danielle hit the nail on the head, right? Like that was the goal. Um, and, and part of it was that I was tired of writing ballroom. I've never really written like straight up, ball I, it's been a while since I've written a straight up ballroom book. Um, but what I really wanted to play with, and I think this is reflective again of the, it's iterating the world that we live in now. Um, I wanted to think about, I wanted to overtly think about the difference between nobility and being noble, capital N, like having mm -hmm. a title and being noble and like having, acting and living with nobility. And, nobility. Mm -hmm. and I think that for me, that was really what I wanted to do with all these heroes was like, talk about these, like these, what it is to be a decent person and why, and ask the kind of questions of like, why do we value the dukedom over, you know, the, why do we value the man who pays, who's like, has made money on the labor more than the labor itself. Right. Um, and so obviously that's a big question and it's not exactly sexy all the time. So for me, it was really easy to sort of say like, well, how do I make that sexy? Right. <laughs> then, that's the big question, you know, right? <laughs> build like a world of criminals and, um, but not entirely criminals, like no, like noble scoundrels, right. Who are, who are, are making their way in the world and overtly rejecting like, the trappings of birth, of like wealth for wealth because of birth or like name as destiny. Um, and so I really, I, I feel like the Bare Knuckle Bastards is probably the series of mine that I've, I have been closest to as I'm writing it. Like I have really felt a lot of, I feel like a lot of me is in these books. And I think that's partially because I'm, I'm getting better at the job. Whether I'm getting better at the writing is a different thing, but I'm getting better at the work of writing. And I'm thinking more about how to fill the books with myself and hopefully make them more human. Absolutely. And I think that definitely comes across because we, you know, we hear from readers all the time that just connects so much to your books. And I'm sure you hear that yourself all the time is just how much people appreciate the stories that you tell. Thank you. Well, I'm going to switch to a couple of rapid fire questions just to keep it fun before we end our um, official portion. So this is uh, just a couple of, or not a couple, not a literal couple, just a figurative couple. Um, so who was your first book boyfriend or girlfriend? Oh, I mean, I think it's, I mean, I think it had, it had to have been Royce from the Kingdom of Dreams, um, who's a real like. Looking back, I've I've reread a Kingdom of Dreams every year since I probably read it for the first time, and this year was the first time that I read it and really put together how much work Judith McNaught was doing to turn around the ship of the romance hero. Like Royce is a real softy. <laughs> and like he's so kind and like decent and it's a really like she and she's sort of overtly on the page like 
throws out, you know, the alpha and says, like, he doesn't want to be that. And I think, uh, I think I've just, I've been in love with him from the beginning. And I think that all of my heroes are a little bit Royce. A little bit Royce. Oh, that's cool. That's nice. <laughs> what is your favorite trope to write? Enemies to lovers. Bonus if they've known each other since they were children and like loved each other or were friends and now are enemies. It's fun to kind of bring them back together. I think I'm, I'm not skilled enough as a writer, <laughs> honestly, like truthfully, I think I'm not skilled enough as a writer to write things that don't have a lot of gas in the engine, you know? And I think Enemies to Lovers like has a lot of gas. Oh, it's got a lot of gas. Right from the start. <laughs> got a lot of feisty characters at that point. Just yeah. head button. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like Tessa Dare can write the most beautiful friends to lovers story ever. And I always get to the end and I'm like breathless and like crying. And I'm like, I don't understand how she did this to me. <laughs> and she can just, she can make the car go on way less gas. And, you know, she's better than I am at it. So <laughs> everybody has their skills for sure. <laughs> so what is your uh, favorite trope to read? I really, I mean, I do love enemies to lovers. Um, I, I also, I mean, like, I love, I love it when a, an author really layers in the tropes. Like, I like enemies to lovers, plus there's only one bed, plus there's a snowstorm, plus there's, you know, a secret baby. Like, yep. throw it all in. The more bananas, the better for me. Like, when it's just, like, two people falling in love in a totally normal way. Get out of here. It's just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and there isn't enough gas in the engine, unless Tess is writing it. <laughs> That's so funny. It's like, I need everything. It's the, uh, exactly. <laughs> All exactly. right. So what is your best deadline fuel? A deadline itself. Oh, <laughs> It'll just keep me up. Um, the anxiety. I, um, I do not write every day. A lot of writers do. And I think that sounds amazing. And I wish that was me, but it's not, I don't write every day. I write when I have a deadline. And, um, so for me, it's very much like I'm up and I work best between the hours of like 4 p.m. and 2 a.m., which is very difficult to do when you have a kid like doing school from home, say, mm -hmm. during a pandemic. Um, <laughs> so, for example, so I'm like, a ca I'm, I caffeinate at like 1030 at night. Wow. And then it keeps me like, for me, it is caffeine and it's late night caffeine. So at the end of your... Um when you're finished and everything, do you just kind of crash for a few days? Yeah, I tell, oh, I take a big break. I usually crash for like a month. Like I, I don't, I don't look at my computer. I don't open a document. Like I take a break. I have to so. refuel. I get that. Yeah. All right. So are you a pantser or a plotter? Oh, I am a full pantser. The only thing I know is the ending. So I'm assuming everyone here, because it's a book club, has read the book or, you know, knows the story of the book. So I'm going to spoil the end, but um, the sort of big moment at the end where everything burns down. I've known that ending for four years. Oh, wow. And I've been writing the Do whole that. series toward that ending. But my best way of describing this, and I apologize if some of you have heard me describe it before this way, is like, imagine you woke up in the morning and you had spent your whole life driving from, or your whole time in the house that you're in, driving from your house to the grocery store the same way. And you woke up in the morning and I said, you have to go to the grocery store, but all those roads that you're usually driving on are closed. Like you have to figure out how to get there. You'd be able to do it, but you'd have a lot of false starts probably. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But. <laughs> all right. Well, let's see. Um, who would you want to be stuck in an elevator with? Period. Yeah. Period. <laughs> who would I want to be stuck in an elevator with? Um, I would really like to meet Cressley Cole. <laughs> I have, I did a podcast about Immortals After Dark and we've never met and I've never spoken to her and I like stuck in an elevator. I have a lot of questions. I have a lot of so. questions for her. <laughs> <laughs> but like oh. in this universe, am I single? Because can I, and is Tom Hardy also single? Because if so, then my answer changes. <laughs> well, you know, I feel like this is a total fantasy. So yes. <laughs> Tom Hardy has gotten rid of his beautiful wife and sure. their two kids. I know they seem really lovely together. So 
but like then I choose Tom Hardy and I have my dog with me too because he seems to prefer dogs to people so oh it's a great way to get that enter <laughs> yep mm-hmm. it's a great exactly because you have like your therapy pup just in case you get stressed exactly. out exactly exactly yeah. this is very good planning I like it <laughs> okay so um what was your favorite date you've ever been on that is a good question. Um, my husband and I live in New York City, and I guess it doesn't really count as a date because we were together. I get it, like we were already together. But um, there is, if you take a certain subway line to the end and then pretend you're asleep on the train, um, the train keeps going and turns around and comes back to go, you know, so it's going downtown and it keeps going and it turns around and then it comes back up to go uptown. Mm -hmm. Um, And you go through an old subway station that's no longer open, but has like Tiffany glass inside and like, yeah. So we did that and that was really cool. Did you have to really really pretend to be asleep? (laughs) Yeah. Well, we just like, kind of like, Stayed very still because they do <laughs> check the train, but they don't wake you up. So, <laughs> That's so funny. They're like, no, they're fine. They're they're just a cute couple, just chilling. <laughs> that is so cool. I think I remember that from the, one of the Ninja Turtle movies. They like filmed it down there. <laughs> there you go. It's City Hall Station, and yeah, it's closed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my last question for you, um, we asked this in our name game because we always love to know what people are uh, watching, reading, and listening to. What is um, a book you've read recently that you would like to recommend to the book club? I just discovered Jody Slaughter, who is a contemporary writer. Um, I read her first book, which is called All Things Burn. The heroine is a... Um, the heroine is... Uh, is being stuck, she has a stalker and she goes to the police in Chicago and the police are like, we can't, we can't do anything for you. Like you can't prove that this is happening. We can't help you. Um, And the stalker is threatening her sister and her children, her sister's children. So the heroine decides she's gonna take matters into her own hands and she hires a hitman and the hitman is the hero. And like talk about high octane juice in the tank. Like. It starts off with this bang. It's super sexy. The page is just like tear by. And by the end, like she's really, I mean, she is just so, such a great writer. She doesn't pull a single punch. It ends exactly the way it should. Um, I'm so excited to see what comes next from her. Mm -hmm. Um, And then for historical readers, because um, I assume a lot of you are historical readers, I really believe that Joanna Shoup is writing the best books of historical right now. And if you have not read her Gilded Age books, which are all set in the in Gilded Age New York, you are missing out. I know a lot of historical readers feel weird about reading New York or reading outside of England. It is worth it. These books are so good. Give them a try. Yeah, take um, the, the most recent series is called the Uptown Girl series. Um, and it uh, it begins with, oh gosh, I can't remember the first, the name of the first book. The most recent one is called The Devil of Downtown and the Prince of Broadway is fabulous and you can read them out of order. So. Yeah, awesome. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for uh, joining us tonight. Um, we're Thanks going to take some me. questions off, um, off camera, off record. I don't know how to call that, but uh, just so we can finish cool. the official part. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching everyone. (laughs) All right. The Rogue of Fifth Avenue. That's the first book in that series. (laughs) 